This is a story pulled from history, but it is also a parable about how science works. The year is 1845, and Newtonian physics has conquered the world. On Earth, Newton's physics predicts the paths of projectiles, explains the tides, and forms one trunk in the scientific tree now bearing the fruits of engineering marvels during the Industrial Revolution. In astronomy, Newton's laws extended the work of Johannes Kepler and provided a concise, accurate, and elegant model of the movement of the heavens. There was just one problem. Uranus's orbit was just a little bit off. If you follow the equations and you calculate where Uranus should be, you would be right most of the time. But sometimes it would wander off course. A mathematician named Verrier had a brilliant solution to this problem. Maybe there is something out there that is affecting Uranus's orbit, another planet. Working from that assumption, he calculated where just such a planet should be. And when astronomers pointed their telescopes at that point, in less than an hour of searching, they found it. Neptune, the eighth planet in our solar system. If scientists were confident in Newton's physics before, they were deliriously confident in Newton's physics now. Verrier was a rock star. Newton was a rock galaxy. The power of Newton's physics was undeniable. It was a few years later that astronomers realized they had another problem. Like Uranus, Mercury's orbit was a little odd. There were times when it just wasn't where Newton's physics said it should be. But Verrier had a solution. There must be something, maybe a planet, closer to the Sun than Mercury that is perturbing Mercury's orbit, pushing it around a bit. Verrier ran his calculations. Would another planet solve the problem? Yes. And it should be right here. So astronomers turned their telescopes towards the sun, and one of them, an amateur astronomer from the countryside, found it. The planet Vulcan. Verrier was skeptical at first, but after examining the equipment and interrogating the poor astronomer, he announced the finding to the world. Over the next 40 years, astronomers would spot Vulcan from time to time, but its proximity to the sun made these observations difficult to verify. In other words, the planet Vulcan had its own replication crisis. And astronomers argued ceaselessly over which observations were legit and which were just mirages. Without definitive confirmation, the existence of Vulcan remained a mystery until a brilliant scientist created a new physical system. Mercury's strange orbit wasn't strange at all under Einstein's physics. It was exactly where it should be. If you've been paying attention, I think this story offers a few lessons about how science works. Lesson one, the exact same reasoning pattern that was successful in the past will not necessarily be successful in the future. Verrier applies the exact same reasoning to finding Neptune as he does to finding Vulcan. Regardless of how successful Newtonian physics was, how many predictions it got right, how many things it explained, it still could be wrong, and it was wrong in this case. No amount of prior successes absolutely guarantees that the next prediction or the next bit of evidence will align with the theory. Scientific theories, even the best theories, are provisional. There's always a little bit of uncertainty and fun in science. Lesson number two, we do not reject theories because they have been disconfirmed. This is a common misconception that you see all over the place. People say things like, well, experiments don't really confirm or prove theories to be true, 
Rather, experiments disconfirm or disprove theories to be true. And if you disprove a theory, then you should get rid of it. It's been disproven or disconfirmed. And if after a series of tests or experiments, a theory fails to be disconfirmed, well, then we have a high confidence that this theory is correct. This idea originally comes from Karl Popper, but it's not an accurate description of what happened in this case. And it's not an accurate description of what happens in science generally. Verrier and his colleagues did not abandon Newtonian physics because Uranus's orbit was a little off. It didn't abandon Newtonian physics when Mercury's orbit was a little off, and observations of Vulcan, verifiable observations, were not forthcoming. Every scientific theory has evidence that is in tension with it. We don't throw the theory away. Newtonian physics is damn useful, and we keep useful things around, even if they can't completely explain all the evidence that we have. We also don't discard theories unless we have a better one. In the 1800s, there was no other theory that could come close to explaining all the physical phenomena that Newtonian physics did. So there's not really an option to discard the theory when you don't have a viable alternative. Even if the evidence doesn't line up perfectly, you gotta work with what you got. Lesson number three. Theories, expectations, and predictions shape perception. That doesn't mean that you only see what you want to see or anything like that. It just means that how you interpret what you see is influenced by your theoretical framework. Several smart, careful astronomers thought they saw Vulcan. I don't think I have to tell you that it's not there. Go to your astronomy textbooks. It's not in there. Send a million probes towards the sun. You're not going to find Vulcan. Astronomers were interpreting other phenomena as Vulcan, because to some degree, that's what the theoretical framework had prepared them to see. At the same time, good scientific practice helps to blunt our misperceptions. There is a reason why replication is a major principle in science. There is a reason why meaningfully testing ideas drive scientific knowledge forward. The scientific community never fully accepted Vulcan's existence precisely because they valued replicable, independent observation. And as the decades wore on and reliable observations were not forthcoming, most astronomers just abandoned the idea of Vulcan, which didn't remove the problem of Mercury's orbit until Einstein came along. Now that you've listened to my favorite bedtime story, check out some of these other videos on reasoning and science. I'll see you next time.